Okay, first of all, thank you so much, Sheila, for for this for this interview. It's really it it's exciting and and I'm also nervous because it feels like um, such a great honor for me to be here um, talking to you and talking about this book that um, the Candidate Libre just published again and translated um, that was originally published in 2000, um, La Promessa di un Sogno. And this book is an incredible and precious document about the 60s and you are also, you're, you're mostly an historian, so you, you perfectly know what you're talking about, but you know what you're talking about also because you were living those years as the protagonist. And so it's it's an interesting mixture, mix, mixture of, a, of a memoir and at the same time is looked, um, it, it's also a selection, it's not just a memoir, like you decide to concentrate on talking about your life, focusing on, on those 10 years the 60s. So I think as an introduction for our public, we should start by asking you why why the 60s, for example? Well, uh, in uh, 1998, there were all these um, people wondering 1968. And um, in that, I, I, I went back and I looked at my, I had these copies of the Evergreen Review, which had things by Sartre and all these people who influenced people like me in the early 60s. And I, I was um, concerned because a lot of the um, stuff about personal experience that we were beginning to try and talk about as women right at the end of the 60s um, was um, actually there in aspects of the culture. And I knew that the, there was connection between that already in the 60s and some aspects of politics. It was very much present in, for example, in the, in the May event, um, people said, you know, take your desires for reality, <laughs> which can, can lead you up to a few strange paths, but still it, there was this impetus to talk about subjectivity as well as the external nature, sort of sociological aspects of society um, that we were trying to change. Yeah, I think I think that's that's really like the one of the most striking aspects of the book and that it in a way it is already feminist in its form because the private becomes political and then becomes connected in a way to to the bigger history and the social history and the cultural history of those years. So I think it's it's really it's really an, an interesting and achieved experiment. But uh, what I wanted to ask you because you were already saying that um, your consciousness as a feminist kind of raised um, at the end of the 60s and it came from from a different engagement in socialist movements so I was wondering whether you think that mm, I don't know I, I was probably wondering if you think that the the other way around uh, is also possible that like from feminism um, a bigger like or a deeper consciousness of also like some other social issues can emerge. Yeah, I th I th I'm sure that it does. And it depends very, very much on circumstances. And also I think the people that you come in contact with. Um, and it, it, it was a, a constant learning process because when we started the very first groups in Britain in 69, um, we were incredibly, anxious, the ones of us who'd been influenced by the left to try to involve working class women, but they didn't want to come to our consciousness raising groups because they had so many things, other things to do. The idea of having leisure to sit around talking about your inner feelings was impossible, except in snatches between um, looking after children and doing part-time work. So we, we could never understand that. And it was very, similar with, with black working class women who were um, very much around where I was living. I lived in uh, Hackney, which was um, it's in a inner city London and had a very um, uh, high percentage of um, people from um, the Caribbean. So um, my neighbors 
were living very different lives. And um, I, I found that the things that I was worried about, which were very much um, feelings of um, really been silenced as a, a, as a young woman who had been taught that by being educated, you became equal with men. But the older um, assumptions that the men had often meant that they didn't take anything that the women said seriously. So we were struggling to be taken seriously. And I, I think also we were rebelling against the um, uh, rather hypocritical respectability of the 1950s, which now I'm older, I think I can understand more because I think having gone through the war, the older generation were desperate to surround themselves with comfort and any um, signs of um, rebellion was seen as, as very threatening. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of going later into this, these aspects, but uh, since you mentioned it, I feel like I want to ask now whether you think that like the pandemic crisis we, we are going through now with might also have the same outcome in terms of need for security and, and a kind of lowering of our expect, expectations in political terms, because that's my fear, I would say. I, I mean, the hope is that it would make people aware of the need for interconnection and care um, as a basis for the values of a society. But I, I suppose, because I mean, I'm now I've just become 78, which is incredibly ancient. And I feel, my goodness, there's all these decades in which we were trying to um, change society. And um, we partially did things, but not always the things we intended. Um, and it's, um, I guess that's why older people get a bit more kind of, which is why it's a very good thing there are younger people around <laughs> because um, you've got ideas of doing things um, that are not been, you haven't been so repeatedly discouraged as, as many of us were. <laughs> Probably, I hope so, but I also feel already already old and it's interesting because in the book uh, you, you, you cover a time span from when you're 17, uh, no, 16 to like uh, 26. And you often say that you already felt old back then. <laughs> interesting. I'm 34 and I, and I kind of have the same feeling and, and sometimes I also remind myself, no, there's a lot of life ahead of you when you should not to be a pessimist as sometimes I tend to be. But yeah, I don't feel it's so different. I, I suppose um, it's just that you get a bit more tired. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably what happens. Um, I wanted um, to, to keep reflecting um, on the book. I, I have a quote that I think it's 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 great because it kind of summarizes some of my questions or things that things that probably um, are still being discussed by now and and you also like ask them as questions in the book so I'm gonna quote I was already troubled by two questions which were to cause many an anxious debate in the 70s asking my diary first whether the prevailing culture of masculinity was only a consequence of capitalism or was there something some underlying structure which we were to call patriarchy secondly i wanted to know whether we should concentrate on changing the attitudes and behavior of the revolutionary left or try to reach women in general and i was wondering like i think this had been for you also the lifetime work like to reflect on this on these things in terms of um strategy i i assume also and so I, I was wondering what what are your conclusions after 60 years from then almost 60 years from then well i i those of us who started the early women's liberation groups disagreed with some women who were in left groups who said um the oppression of women is just caused by capitalism. So we, we said it uh, pre-existed. And um, we, we read Simone de Beauvoir a lot. <laughs> and Simone de Beauvoir used the term patriarchy. And uh, 
when Kate Millett in America wrote a very early book, she, um, on sexual politics, she also used the term patriarchy. And so in the early um, 70s, I, I just took over that term. But gradually thinking about it, I thought this is a confusing term because it, it tends to imply a certain form of male control. Um, the control, the immediate control of a man in the household over the women in the household relating to, you know, agricultural societies and um, the ownership of um, the um, homestead and the land. I decided that um, what we needed to think about was the ways in, in which capitalism had changed these relationships of gender and had created both um, more um, isolation and um, pro economic problems often for women, but at the same time had created openings which enabled a different degree of freedom for women, even though um, it was curtailed in, in many ways for particularly for poorer women. So I wanted to not have just the idea of a small elite moving upwards through um, gaining equal opportunities um, as the way of emancipating women. And that was the reason why um, I began to feel that having just one term like that, which suggested, I mean, other feminists would argue with this, but I thought it suggested a particular continuing form of uh, male control. Whereas strategically, it seemed to me that you needed to historically look at the opportunities for women in, in different kinds of societies. In, in the history of Britain, um, for example, it seems that even you know, in pre-capitalist times, um, Anglo-Saxon women could own, um, be, you know, be given land and own land. Um, when the Normans came, the Normans imposed very early marriages and um, no kind of economic security for daughters. So um, those kinds of differences, I think, have to be taken into account when you think about women's position. But no, hardly anyone agrees with me and everybody uses the term patriarchy, <laughs> but I keep going on about this just because I think um, it's creating a group of people as um, total oppressors is just a dead end. I don't believe that that is how men and women relate. I mean, men can be um, violent and oppressive but also women are, are not sort of innocent type people all the time. They, they have their own ways of organizing and resisting and um, sometimes could be um, oppressive to, to others. So I, I don't see that men are all bad and women all good. I, I, you're really like, um, I'm getting emotional because those are the things I believe in too. And I, and I really love how you, you try to at least uh, root the, the oppression of women also in like, not necessarily in capitalism, but in some sort of economical um, systems, or at least like trying to, to root where this kind of prejudice, for example, against women starts as not, not as it was some kind of original fault of men or some, some kind of, and I think it's a very optimistic way also of seeing things, believing that there is, indeed the chance of, of, of a more rational and a more equal organization for people because it's not something like the fear of the other is not something that we have in our own you know it's not something that men or people in general have as something that is penetrated to them which is something i think it's very important to stress right now because I, this is just my my i don't know my observation of how today of so many many women's struggles have been uh, flattened by the media as there was like this kind of gender divide or gender fight, which which I think is very, it's very sad, but it's an actual risk of how the mainstream kind of appropriates some kind of 
grassroots struggles the notion agree and this is not actually a question it was just a personal consideration but um but it, it is really important because i i think otherwise you just go back to an old style i mean before we had any kind of women's liberation movement women of an older generation would just say, oh, men are men and, you know, and they do this and women uh, uh, have to do this. And it seemed so depressing that this was the, the only kind of dichotomy that you can think of. And um, so I think it's helpful to try and understand strategically where the openings are and the possibilities. Totally. And I think, and I think one of the passages in the book that most Struck, like that struck me the most uh, was when you tell about um I don't know if you want to go into this but I'm gonna ask and if you don't want to talk about it you, you just tell me but how you tell about this rape attempt you you experienced when when you were in France uh, um in when you were 18 in Paris and I think it's it's really amazing how you really tell this story without um I don't know it doesn't feel like a trauma, but just something that you, you kind of, I don't know, you were able to uh, to process in, in such an inspiring way without seeing yourself as a victim, even in this moment, which is something that to me was amazing. I don't know if you want to, if you want to tell <laughs> about the story, it's probably a too personal question, but I think it's really, it's really in contrast with some the kind of narrative that we sometimes have to to witness nowadays of women being constantly just the victim and and it's it's amazing i think the way in which you tell a story in which you're clearly the victim of an of an attempt at rape but still you, you show such such an inspiring agency you know and it's something that is very different from from this kind of narrative that we sometimes get as women. I, I think when young women read that my memoir, they'll be amazed at our sexual ignorance. I mean, we were so ignorant about sex, but the boys were ignorant as well as girls, really, as we, because uh, <clears throat> we didn't have any. We had biology, which was, it was very technical. It said, the penis is inserted into the vagina. And I thought, <laughs> and this had nothing, you know, there were all these anxieties and no information about contraception and um, availability of contraception. I mean, I'm sure that it was the same in Italy. I, um, but I had just become, I hadn't got any kind of left, overtly left politics, although I was radical and rebellious, but I did understand about colonialism and the um, ways in which North Africans were treated in France, because I'd seen that in the short time I'd been there. And I, um, I could see the, these, the conditions these guys were working under who were building the new um, um, suburbs in France, around Paris. I, um, I, I mean, I, I just got into this stupid situation because <laughs> I, I, because of my, my ignorance really. I mean, it, 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 I later discovered that I could have got this American Express delivered things. I didn't even know that such things could be done. I just thought I had to go and get this trunk, uh, which I was going out to the suburbs to collect, which my parents had sent, and then having asked the way of an older woman, she asked a young man and um, he mistook the situation and um, just, you know, took, tried to take sexual advantage. In, in fact, I, I wasn't raped. I think perhaps if I had been, I may have felt differently, but I did, I did understand or try to understand something about, you know, where where this man who was living in these shacks, there was open shacks with really no heating, no, there was no facilities at all, um, where the building workers lived. So I I, I knew that, that there was some problem there, <laughs> but I, 
I was determined I wasn't going to have that as the first sexual experience of my life. So I did just argue with him because I realized I couldn't physically fight. He was stronger. <laughs> it's, it's really like, um, to me, it's been, it's been incredible to read it. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, but do you have the feeling that nowadays things really changed in terms of like um but we i think that because of the internet for example my generation was was uh, unfortunately because of the internet because in, in italy we don't have any kind of sexual education that's mandatory for the whole nation so it's it's very messy the situation but um of course like we, we probably have or we, we started to have more knowledge about some issues but at the same time i have the feeling that some problems in terms of like for women um, relying a lot on romantic relationship, which is something that you also highlight in the book, how despite your living a, a free sexual life, you were still, um, I don't know, thinking of uh, love relationship as some kind of an, uh, of an important accomplishment maybe, because um, I think for many women, it, is still the case and and why is that and why and why is it something different to say that a romantic relationship is an achievement in a way or a step that you have to go through or something that you might want and an experience in your life because i don't think also that um romantic relationship is something completely bad and we should get rid of them <laughs> that's not what i'm saying <laughs> But what I'm saying is that it's interesting that despite the fact that we might be more aware of, um, I don't know, the, the chances that we can um, take as, as a generation in terms of um, of sex, at the same time, there still it there still are so many, so many. I don't know that there's still the risk that so many women kind of uh, consider the self-worth in terms of being object of of being of being wanted by someone you know I, I don't know if that was clearly what I was saying but I hope you got what the meaning of my question well I I think the, the in coming out of the 1950s we were so ferocious to experience things we didn't want to be closeted and protected and I, perhaps that's a difference because we were just fed up with being people saying, oh no, you can't do this. I mean, it was somewhat better in Britain than in America, and then in, sorry, in not America, in France. Um, um, but at the same time, there was still this thing about virginity and this was this, you know, such a commotion about that. But I, um, so we, we rejected all that, but then that left us very vulnerable, really, even though we were quite privileged young women because we'd been educated. Um, so I think there was that fight for personal autonomy and freedom, and then um, a contradictory desire for romantic love because that was very much what we grown up on on films and things in the 50s. Um, I still think um, actually that people want both the capacity to have individual freedom and um, ecstasy and romance and happiness and mutuality. So it, I think for a long time I was always really scared of a tendency to be dependent in my relationships of men. And it took me, it took me kind of years to realize. So I was quite old, I could actually have a relationship of interdependence. And um, I, I, I don't think it's necessary to have to be so old as I was to realize that. I mean, uh, I, um, I'm somewhat uh, dependent on Mike as far as the fact that he understands how to do the computer technology better than me and but I realize I've got other things that I can do that he can't do as well so I feel that I can accept that balance now but I used to to worry about it 
and yeah, it's um, really it's really a hard balance and i think it's really hard uh, it's something that also shows like that you you've always been since from the book at least you've always been um very uncompromising in terms of your own freedom also when it came to I don't know, um, even consumption choices, because you talk a lot about how you've been judged for not being um, enough, I don't know, not looking like a, like a revolutionary or this kind of things, because oh, you, you were funny. also interested in, in, yeah. in other things and enjoying life and enjoying also the, the yeah. music or the fashion of the times, which of course <laughs> I think it would have been such a waste not to enjoy those years <laughs> in, in all these amazing like kind of manifestations. But I um I was wondering how you how you look at this kind of side of yourself right now, also knowing that unfortunately like whether um the, the promise of a dream kind of faded, but uh, so many symbols of the zero got like kind of subsumed or co-opted by 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 pop culture and the mainstream and this kind of thing and I, and I sometimes ask myself whether you think that um that it still it, it it should still be possible to imagine a world in which one can be free in his choices both in sexual and, and personal terms and um and in in yeah, as I said, in consumption and in lifestyle, in a way, despite for that being um, accused of not being a, a, a good revolutionary or a good leftist, because those are still problems that I, <laughs> I had to deal with in my own uh, life or in my or when I when I did things as an activist. Sometimes I've been deemed of not being of not conforming to this kind of different lifestyle, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, yeah. The, um, yeah, so there was a, there was a, a, a so there is a, a kind of, it's hard, isn't it? Because I suppose if people are in conflict, then there's a tendency to um, try and cut down on diversions and focus. But I mean, the reality was that we weren't, I mean, although we were, opposed to capitalism we we went in some sort of guerrilla battle physical uh, fight or anything we were we were living normal lives of teaching or working and um doing whatever we were doing i um so it, it wasn't very realistic the, the the left groups of the time having this idea that we were all having to have this puritanical strip down. The um, I heard from an American friend whose um, parents were in the Communist Party, how when she interviewed older communist women in America about the time when they were communists in the third in the uh, Cold War, she um, was was very amazed because these older women said that the, there had been a time when the American Communist Party said they shouldn't have any babies because fascism was imminent and um <laughs> the, 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 this woman said we stole the sperm <laughs> so there was this kind of subversion by women <laughs> of, the, of the ideas that the guys had about um, the need to be ready for some kind of um iconoclastic event it's a great story and i and i really believe like that yeah trying to hold together like happiness and, and engagement is really the key like you can't have just one and i think your life is a great example of that or at least the life that you tell in the book um a friend of mine called Lynn siegel uh, wrote uh who's a feminist and a socialist wrote a book about radical happiness recently I'm gonna I'm gonna read this, um, but I wanted to ask since since really like um, your um, your book is so about how your theory has been influenced and sometimes challenged by your experience and your, your practice your practice at both as an activist and as an individual, the fact that right now we are really um, 
it's really hard like to to meet people and and, and interact with people because of the situation like mm -hmm. I, I feel like we are all in this not together but all in this apart and and i i i see how this radicalizes in in polarizes i would say rather than for radicalizing which wouldn't be a bad word but how it polarizes the, the the debate the fact that we are all constantly recently just interacting virtually By email and things but i i haven't got any other social media i only have email but email's bad enough for me because i end up sort of going like this all day and then i think well i might as well have a job what am i doing i'm meant to be retired you know yeah it's really like, there's these because it takes me a long time doing emails i i got a problem with my wrist in the 90s of um, repetitive strain injury so i can't really just use smartphone and i have to be at a particular level and stuff i so it means that i'm stuck with the computer all day yeah 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 um yeah i don't know <laughs> what i would say about the fact that it's really it's really hard to imagine politics without the, the possibility to share experiences and yeah. share spaces and and so yeah i don't know i don't know <laughs> what will happen but i wanted to ask you about like your your thoughts or your feelings about the um, newest generation like I, I would be called the millennial and then but the newest generation that's so that seems so aware about problems like uh environment or also like uh, sexual identity issues and these kind of things do you think that because because i i, I love our like all, all your younger generation are of course very very um committed to the causes at the same time and sometimes i i feel like they miss some history and it's also because of the internet the fact that you feel like you live in a constant present in a way Mm. And and um and this is the only aspect that sometimes puzzles me, but I wanted to hear your opinion on that. <laughs> yes, it's true because uh, I mean Boris Johnson gets away with doing all these things, and it's as though each time it's all wiped out. He does some crazy thing that doesn't work out, and then it's just wiped out completely. So it, 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 there is always that need to remember the past. I I. I just have always been interested in going back and uh, finding out what what things were like. I um, from just being early, just being young. I don't know. I think it might have been because my mother used to tell me lots of stories about her life when she was young. Um, I, I really don't know why it was, but I I I've always been interested in in the past. But quite a lot of my own friends of my own age are not so interested in finding out about the past. No, that's probably true. But do you see many, do you see something that it's, you think it's the deepest difference from, from this younger generation and yours? Or do you think that in a I, way it's always like a recurring of- I don't know, I know a few yes. young women who are really interested in the past, um, but I, 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 th I think there must be a tendency with the, with the, uh, the images and the quick changes and the technology that must be a way of moving people on. But perhaps if there's a, if people are being moved on in time, click, 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 and then erase, there's probably going to be some kind of counter move against that. The people will want to return to, to more um, going back and looking at archives and memories and um, and I mean people are interested I mean I've, I've been um, through lockdown I started to write about the 70s and really? um, yes I've nearly like it, the, the sequel of promise of a dream <laughs> yes, it's just, it's 20 years later or so it's just um going to be done this year later I think by Verso and at the moment I'm worried about all the, the photographs and things I do, um, I do this it's in the final bits of putting together 
It's great that you had. I called it um, Daring to Hope. That's nice. on the seventies. And then I, um, more in a more uh, embryonic form, I'm thinking of doing the eight writing about the eighties. Oh wow! Did, the... So eventually you're gonna. I, I'm not going to carry on into the nineties. I'll stop no. there. <laughs> this is not <enough> life. <laughs> Why? It's, it's so amazing to see, like really, I... the memoir and in so many volumes. It's like, uh, but it, you, you've been, you've been a, a student of. Eric and a friend of Eric Hobsbawm, so you're not afraid of, of writing like this very <laughs> long books on history. So. Well, I, I, um, I, I feel as though it's important for a lot of people who participated in the women's movement as other um, radical movements of the past to try to write their versions down because Otherwise, when younger people go and just look at archives, it's very difficult for them to get behind, to get to the feelings that people might have felt. And it's not that my feelings are obviously you only ones, but also we, we did share a lot. So some of the things I'm writing about would be recognized by other people who lived through it. Um, although not all of them. <laughs> No, it, re it really is a different experience to just read a, his a, a, a book on history and reading someone's person, like, point of view on it. And it's really, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different experience. And I think it it really helps to, to understand an historical phase, which is what you did in, in your book. And I would have so many other questions, but I've been asked not to not to use more than 40 minutes. So um, time is up, unfortunately, but it's been- I just got, this is the picture that was in the uh, original book. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, it, it's in here. <laughs> you're, you're beautiful. And it's a beautiful <laughs> picture. But now my hair's gone long because we can't go to the hairdressers. So I've had to cut my own hair. They're really pretty. I might cut the back. <laughs> Mine, mine are, are super long, but I, I don't mind it. I must say, <laughs> about it, and not to have an excuse not to go to the hairdresser. But um, I have to thank you so much. Really, it's been it's been great to read the book, and it's been great to talk to you. Um, thank you. I was very nervous, incredibly nervous I, about doing this. I, I hope it was not a terrible experience for you. Um, I, and thank you again. It's really good to meet you too, all of you.